So I think it's one on one. So we will get started. Um, welcome back, everybody, to another week of the CAN seminar series. Um, well, today we have Jill Sias. I will introduce her real quickly and then I will, will pass the word to Dr. Chehab and Dr. Al Qadi real quickly. Um, Josias is the director of Center for Infrastructure Resilience to Climate. She's the co-director of Infrastructure and Climate Network. She's a professor at University of New Hampshire. She serves as the vice president uh, for, 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 for Association of Asphalt Pavement Technologists and Associate editor for the International Journal of Road Materials. She received her bachelor's degree again from University of New Hampshire and her master's and doctoral degrees from North Carolina State University. Um, her research focuses on the characterization of asphalt materials, specifically with respect to recycling, cracking and aging, as well as the impacts of climate change on transportation. Um, so before we will pass on the word to uh, Dr. Sias, um, well, well, Dr. Chehab, would you like to say a few words before Thank we you, begin? Thank you, Egman. Well, um, it's really a pleasure and honor to have uh, Dr. Sias with, uh, with us today. Uh, Dr. Al-Qadi is going to be late. Typically, you know, he would have been here at 1, but he has an appointment, uh, so he'll be coming at 1.15 or so. But uh, it's a, you know it's, it's uh, honestly uh, it's it's a, it's an honor for me to uh, have uh, Joe, uh, Dr. Sias, with us here. Um, Dr. Sias' uh, uh, main area of expertise is advanced characterization of uh, uh, asphalt materials. Um, she did graduate from NC State and worked with Dr. Kim, and later kept developing this model as she knew as she uh, moved to the University of New Hampshire. Uh, while at the University of New Hampshire, uh, she did uh, branch into uh, studying the effect of climate change on pavement design uh, and pavement management. And then she was able to establish, along with her colleagues, um, ICNET, which is kind of a global uh, uh, center uh, that engages uh, colleagues from around the world um, you know, on the issues of uh, infrastructure and uh, climate. Um, uh, personally, uh, uh, I would like to say that uh, Joe uh, is a very, very, very dear friend. Um, so we studied together at NC State. She graduated uh, one year before me. But, you know, at the time of when I, when I defended, she came back from New Hampshire to attend my defense live, not through Zoom. And I will never forget that for her. And. Uh, uh, thank you, Joe, for that. And uh, so it's really an honor. And without uh, further ado, Joe, uh, uh, impress us with your work. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Chehab. Um, well, before we begin, um, well, I would like to remind us that we have 40 minutes for presentation, which will be followed by a question and answer. And if you have any questions, please raise your hand, which I will, will give you the word at the uh, at 1.45, or you can also write your questions in the chat and then I will read them to Dr. Sias. And as Dr. Chehab said, without further ado, Dr. Sias. Thank you. Um, and first of all, thanks for the opportunity to be here today and, and give the seminar um, as part of this series. And uh, thanks for the great introduction. And Ghassan, I wouldn't have missed your dissertation defense for the world, so. <laughs> Um, so what I'm going to go through today is some of the recent work that we've been doing at UNH, really looking at incorporating uh, impacts of climate change into flexible payment design analysis and management. So um, as I start going here, Um, just a little bit more on the UNH uh, Center for Infrastructure Resilience to Climate. So this is really um, a group of faculty at UNH that are focused on the research side of things, looking at developing new methods and approaches 
for resilient transportation, specifically looking at uh, impacts of climate change. Um, but also a part of this is we're working with the Carsey School of Public Policy, recognizing um, that there needs to be effective public policy solutions to be able to implement um, a lot of what we're talking about needs to change to be able to do this. And then also the Infrastructure and Climate Network, or ICNET. Um, so ICNET was originally developed for or put together for the Northeast um, US. And is currently, it's a collaborative network of over 100 climate scientists, transportation engineers, um, policymakers, um, practitioners, bringing together the climate scientists and the engineers to really look at how do we accelerate that research and how do we get into the adaptation uh, conversation in terms of making sure we've got the impacts to climate um, taken care of. Now, ICNET um, has grown into ICNET Global, um, which is really a, a recent effort that started a little over a year ago, um, where we're really trying to develop an international network of networks that are working in this area. So the idea here is to develop worldwide capacity um, establish links among the different practitioners and research groups that are working in this area, and really to start thinking about how we're going to develop the next generation of folks that are able to work across the different disciplines and work with each other to address these climate-related transportation challenges. Um, so there's a little bit more information here, um, and we're always looking for folks that are interested in engaging in the ICNET global activities um, so feel free to get in touch with us if that's something that you're interested in doing. Now, a little bit more on just the topic of um, my presentation, what I'm going to cover today, a um, little bit on the background and motiva motivation um, with respect to changing climate. We know that global temperatures are rising and they're projected to continue to rise. Um, we also have precipitation patterns that are changing. Sea levels are rising, and as a function of the rising sea level, groundwater levels are also going to rise, and that extends further into the um, inland than surface water inundation. So we need to think about rising groundwater levels. You don't necessarily see it. And then all of these changes um, are going to affect our pavement performance and our service life okay, all over the world. So we really need to start thinking about how these impacts are going to increase our maintenance okay, and costs. And those have been estimated, at least in the US, to be billions of dollars just from the changing, expected changes in climate. So we really need to start thinking about the approaches of how we're going to deal with this. So looking at just kind of a framework um, of how we incorporate climate projections into pavement design. Thing, a couple of things we can think about. So we'll talk through this a little bit here. So the first thing you really need to do is identify what climate concerns or what forcings we already know affect the pavement. We got a pretty good handle of that because we designed for those already. Then we need to think about what type of information we need or engineers need to adjust designs based on changes in climate. Okay, again, something we've got a pretty good handle on. Um, and then determine which of those risks or which of those changes in those different environmental factors they okay, have, looking at recent history, or are likely to change in the future, and the extent to which climate scientists can provide that information. Now that's an important piece of it. It's not just about what the pavement design engineers or transportation engineers need in terms of information. It also depends on what the current state of the climate science and those models can provide and the resolution and the accuracy or uncertainty that's associated with that information. It's all important part of what we need to consider. So what we can do. You know, for some purposes, okay, we can stop right now there. We know enough about the vulnerability of the system okay, and the direction of the future change to be able to easily build resilience in. Okay, so for example, if we know we've got rising temperatures, it's relatively straightforward. We've got the tools, we can change the PG bind grade of our binder that we're using um, in our mixtures. But for other situations, 
Okay, and especially when we're talking about planning and maybe longer term design, we need to do a little bit more. So that's more of what we're gonna talk about today. So when we're talking about doing more, one of the important things okay, is to understand where those future climate projections come from, how they're generated and what type of information is available. So starting from the top, use the future climate projection data that we get that climate scientists develop and make available first comes from these general circulation models. So these general circulation models are models of the physical processes of the globe. So it's looking at the interaction between the atmosphere, the oceans, and all the different uh, parts and how things are moving and projected changes. And so these GCMs or these general circulation models okay, are at a relatively coarse resolution. They're modeling the entire globe okay, and it is on a gridded scale. Okay, so the resolution that you get coming out of these GCMs is rather coarse. Okay? And as an example, you can see, you know, a representative um, diagram there on the upper right of uh, North America. And it gives you an idea of kind of the coarseness of the resolution that you'd get out of these GCMs. And now there's also regional climate models, okay, which break this down similar types of approach, but looking at a smaller area. And in the re regional climate models, these are also gridded models, okay, and they do give you slightly better resolution. So you can see how the picture changed in the upper right. However, they don't necessarily have the resolution that we need for a site-specific design. The other thing to consider is that there are multiple models. Okay? So there's not just one GCM or just one RCM, okay? just like there's not one fatigue model. Okay? There's multiple different models out there. And it's important to consider multiple models and use the data that's been generated at multiple models, because then we can get a handle for some of the uncertainty. And so <clears throat> the figure that I've got up there now is just showing you an example okay, of annual average temperature projected using um, nine, nine of the latest generations of the model simulations. Okay? And you can see for the um, historical data, all the different models overlap, which makes sense, right? They're, they're calibrating their models based on historical data. So they better overlap with the historical time period. But then as we start to move into the future, okay, and the further into the future we get, you can see the range in the predicted values changes a lot. And some of the models tend to predict, for the example that I'm showing here, you know, slightly higher average temperatures. Some of them are predicting lower average temperatures. Okay? It all depends on how their model is constructed Okay, and how they're predicting what the future is going to be. So it's important because we, we don't know what the future is going to be to be able to look at or bring together that information from multiple different models to get an idea of what that uncertainty is looking into the future. And then in addition to the different models, we also have multiple scenarios that we're looking at. Okay, so there's multiple future scenarios. Basically, we don't know what humans are going to do. Okay, so there's different types of scenarios that are um, projected or developed based on different human behavior. Okay, and these are the RCP or representative concentration pathways and <clears throat> is, is basically um, you know, probably the term that you've heard. So each of these different models is run based on different scenarios. Okay, so there's the higher emission scenario, which would be the RCP 8.5, okay, or lower emission scenarios. So it's important to look at those projections from multiple models under different types of scenarios. And so we've got the scenarios that um, that run through the global climate models or the general circulation models. Okay? And then we've also got different scenarios that are associated with sea level rise, which is the other figure that I'm showing. Okay, So multiple sea level rise scenarios 
okay, multiple, multiple future climate scenarios <clears throat> and multiple models um, all need to be considered when we're looking at the future climate data. So <clears throat> now we take all of those <clears throat> and we also need to then bring that or downscale it to site specific information or a specific weather station. And there's multiple approaches for doing the downscaling. Okay. And it's important potentially to also consider different downscaling approaches um, for taking that climate data and bringing it to the site specific information that you need to do a pavement design. Now, that's the climate science piece of it. Okay? Now, there's also different types of approaches okay, in general to account for climate change and payment design. And so we're going to talk about several of these, and I'll go through several examples um, of different types of approaches. Now, probably the most common approach that folks have used to date and that are most familiar with is what we call a scenario-based approach or a top-down approach. Okay, now all of these approaches, it's very important to have stakeholders involved from the beginning. So you'll see that as, as part of each of the approaches. But in the top-down approach, okay, once we involve the stakeholders, basically what you're doing is you're choosing which climate change scenarios you're going to evaluate. So you choose your, say for example, the RCP eight and a half and four and a half. Okay, so from the start, you, you say, these are the ones that we're gonna evaluate. Then you go through the process of evaluating the performance of your pavement under those future climate scenarios and identify you know, suitable adaptation actions or uh, pathways that you can take. And then you'd evaluate the different adaptation costs to make your choice um, or selection in terms of make, you know, helping to make decisions on what to do planning for the future. Now there's also an asset-based approach or what we call a bottom-up approach. And here you, you look at things a little bit differently. So in this approach, what you're gonna do is you're gonna identify different adaptation alternatives first, okay? And then you're going to choose a model for your system, for your payment system in this case, and define different performance metrics. Okay, so you're defining what you are um, considering to be adequate performance. Okay? And then from there, you're going to develop relationship between the climate okay, and those performance metrics or variables um, that you're evaluating. And then you do a climate stress test of the asset or if you're looking at a particular system. <clears throat> okay, so it's a very different approach than the scenario-based approach. And then more recently, there's a hybrid approach that combines these two. Okay, so it uses both the bottom-up approach okay, and the top-down approach. Okay, so you take the bottom-up approach and then when you get to the top there, you come across and relate the climate change scenarios and then go through the process of di evaluating different adaptation um, alternatives. So we'll go through examples of a scenario-based approach um, and a hybrid approach. So for the scenario-based approach, this is um, based on some work that was done um, the last couple of years led by um, Ann Stoner. So there's a, a publication on this and there's the, the reference that'll come up in a minute. Um, but really this was looking at examining how climate change is going to impact pavement performance. And we're looking at um, 24 sites Okay, across the continental US. So the tools that were used with the AASHTO uh, pavement ME um, for the pavement evaluation and for this approach, just looking at two different pavement structures. So there was a typical interstate pavement structure and a typical primary road structure that were evaluated. And then looking at least to start with just one GCM. So again, just one model and one future scenario for this initial work. Okay. And then a lot of the work went into statistically downscaling this information to the daily projections at the 24 different sites okay. and putting it into the form that pavement ME needs um, for the climate input. And from this, okay, you can just look at the projected changes in performance. So again, 20 different sites. Okay. And the focus here was looking at how 
the number of months or the time to failure for different distresses was going to change relative to a historic time period. Okay, so the historic time period was uh, set up as um, 1980 to 2000, so the 20 year period, and looking at various 20 year periods into the future and evaluating the change and what this graph is showing right here is just the projected number of months to failure um, from the perspective of Reading. They looked at different um, distresses as well, um, but this just gives you an idea of how um, that type of scenario-based approach works okay, and the types of things that you can do with it. Now, the hybrid or asset slash scenario-based approach Okay, we'll step through the framework for this. And this is, again, developed by uh, Jane Knott, who is a recent PhD graduate um, from UNH. <clears throat> and again, multiple um, publications that step through the different pieces of this approach. So here again, uh, first step is to meet with the stakeholders, identify what stressors we're gonna be evaluating. Okay? And then part of the approach is to do a vulnerability assessment. So we're looking at a particular um, section or segment of roadways okay, and identified which ones we wanted to um, evaluate further in this approach. Okay, and then choosing a pavement performance model okay, and what metrics we're looking at. And then from there, once you've made those decisions, okay, we can create a pavement climate sensitivity catalog. And I'll have another slide on this in, in just a minute. Um, so you can either, if you're starting from scratch, you need to create one of these, okay? or if you've already got a uh, sensitivity catalog developed for your structure or structures that you're considering, you can consult with that. From there, you choose different adaptation alternatives that you want to evaluate, okay? and then analyze your downscared climate projection information. Okay. Combining that, you can determine different adaptation pathways and okay. make some choices in terms of um, which ones are most realistic. Okay. Evaluate the life cycle costs. Okay. And then I'll show you uh, some of this where you can create a pathways map. Okay. And then from that, you can construct a flexible plan a four different adaptation alternatives. Okay, so one of the things when considering um, an adaptation alternative, you wanna make sure that whatever action you're taking now is not going to preclude you know, beneficial actions in the future. Okay, so that's one thing that you need to think about and this approach allows you to construct it so you can do things in a stepwise manner okay, and be flexible so that you can reevaluate where you stand as you move into the future. So as you get better climate information, okay, or as you see what's happening um, with the performance, okay, you have the ability to be flexible and make different choices. You're not locked into a certain choice or a certain pathway. Okay, so illustrating this. Um, so this is a case study that was conducted to illustrate this framework. And uh, what we started with was a section of um, the New Hampshire coastline, which is not very big, um, but we started with the New Hampshire coastline and we're looking at the combination of changes to the pavement design, considering groundwater rise ca caused by sea level rise. And so you can see the figure on the right um, gives you an idea of how far inland the extent of groundwater rise is due to sea level rise. So you can see it happens, you know, depending on the geology of the area, it can be a couple kilometers inland. So we're looking at um, the groundwater rise caused by sea level rise, okay, as well as changes to temperature. Okay, and for the different temperature changes, we're looking at how the seasons are expected to change. So as the average annual temperatures rise, okay, we're looking at the definition of different seasons changing. So the length of the seasons change. Okay, and that impacts how we design our pavement structures. 
The particular pavement that we uh, were looking at, okay, again, from a result from the, the vulnerability study that we conducted is Route 286, which is a regional east-west corner, um, a corridor in the south um, southern area of the coastline. Um, it's not a highly trafficked route, but it is one of a few evacuation routes. Okay, so it is a, an important roadway from that perspective. So you can see on the left hand side, the current cross section in the, um, the section of that roadway that we're evaluating. Um, so not a hefty structure, but a decent pavement structure. And you can see where the current groundwater level is. Okay, so the current groundwater level is just below the base course. So with this particular location, with one foot of sea level rise, okay, that groundwater table gets into the base layer, 2.7 feet of sea level rise, it's almost to the bottom of the asphalt layer. Okay, and as we get into higher sea level rise scenarios, this section of the roadway is actually inundated all the time. So looking at this case study, so we've got this particular location, okay, we've gone through the process of figuring out what the groundwater levels are going to do as a function of time. We know how our seasons are changing or due to our temperature increases. Okay, and those are the two things that we um, evaluated in this particular study. But you can also evaluate other parameters. Okay? If you wanted to look at um, precipitation changes, Okay, you could add that in too. It just wasn't done as part of this particular study. So now that we've determined our pavement structure that we're evaluating and the two different um, variables, so the sea level rise or groundwater table and the temperature increases, now what we can do is we can look at developing that pavement climate sensitivity catalog. Okay, so here what we did was selected um, determined ahead of time what adaptation alternatives we would consider. Okay, so for, again, for this particular case study, the alternatives that we considered were thickening the gravel base okay, and also thickening the asphalt surface layer. Okay, so those are the two things that we considered as adaptation alternatives. So the way we develop these sensitivity catalogs, if you look at this upper left, okay, so this is the case where we've got the 406 millimeter gravel base, which is the existing situation, okay, and then we can look at a combination of groundwater rise in terms of millimeters, okay, and temperature rise, which is the horizontal axis, and look at how much additional asphalt do we need a to achieve a required or a desired level of reliability. So for this analysis, we're looking at at least 85% reliability. And so we looked at how much for that particular gravel base layer thickness, how much additional asphalt do we need okay, over what's existing? Okay, and those ratios are the required asphalt to really reach that 85% reliability under the combination of groundwater rise and temperature rise as compared to the existing condition. So we did this for four different gravel base layer thicknesses. Okay, so you can see as you go from the thinner gravel base to the thicker gravel base okay, in the lower right, the amount of additional asphalt that you need to achieve that 85% reliability um, decreases, which makes sense. Okay, but now we have that relationship between how much asphalt or how what our pavement performance is, okay, or what we need to achieve our desired level of pavement performance as a function of a combination of different groundwater and temperature combinations. Now, no, we don't have any timeline associated with this yet, right? We haven't picked any scenarios. Okay? We haven't looked at any particular models. All we're doing is looking at the sensitivity of our system and our adaptation alternatives that we've selected to the climate variables that we're choosing to evaluate. So next step, once we've got this climate sensitivity catalog, now, we look at the timing of the effects. 
Okay, so now is when we pull in the different um, scenarios. So the RCPs, you can see those are the top line across the top. So we looked at you know, the timing of four different RCPs, okay, combined with different sea level rise scenarios. So the top row in the table here is the combination of the RCP and the sea level rise scenario that we're evaluating. Okay, and then you can see for the different years, so we've got this broken down into decades, based on those combination of sea level rise and RCP scenario, the extent of what we're going to expect for groundwater depth and temperature rise for our particular location. Okay, so here's where you combine that timing okay, with what's actually going to happen in terms of what we're expecting for the temperature and groundwater. So for example, if we wanted to choose an RCP of six and the interme intermediate sea level rise scenario, we'd be looking at the values in these two columns. So depending on the year that we wanna look at, so if say we're designing for 2040, okay, we'd be looking at having to consider a temperature rise of 1.7 and the groundwater depth being around 520 millimeters below the pavement surface. So we take that information, go back to our pavement sensitivity catalog, and then be able to evaluate, okay, what are our different options? How much asphalt, you know, what would be our asphalt layer thickness for different base layer thicknesses? And in that way you can evaluate those different adaptation alternatives for the different timing. And you can also see in the, the very far right column, okay, also looking at traffic. So in this particular case study, we did consider um, increase in traffic over time. So once you've got the timing of those effects, then again, like I mentioned, you can look at different adaptation pathways. Okay? So you can think about different options okay, for what you're going to do to adapt that particular roadway to meet the requirements of the future climate. So here you look at the different base layer thicknesses. Okay, so recognizing that if we're going to change our base layer thickness, it's a rehabilitation um, that happens. And we can look at the timing of that being, you know, different periods of time. So for this particular example, okay, our pathway number one is just using our existing base layer, which is the 406 millimeter, and just considering continuous overlays, okay? Nothing else, no rehabilitation, just continuing to overlay, add more um, asphalt, okay, as we move forward. Okay, other different pathways that are considered, the pathway 1A would be same structure, but doing the rehabilitation. Okay, so doing the rehabilitation in 2020, so you're starting with a nice new pavement structure and then overlays. Okay, and then the same thing you can see, the different numbered pathways are a combination of different base layer thicknesses okay, and different timings for that rehabilitation where you reconstruct the roadway to thicken it up. So once we've got these, then you can look at these different pathways. So um, this is a graphical representation of the thickness of the asphalt layer that's needed to reach, achieve that 85% reliability for the different pathways. So let's start with looking at pathway number one, which is the blue line at the top. Okay, so we're starting in the year 2020. We're not doing anything, no reconstruction. We're just starting with our existing pavement. And then the only thing that's done is additional asphalt overlay when it's needed. So you can see for that first pathway, you'd need the additional overlay thickness every 10 years with the exception of 2060 to maintain that 85% reliability. Pathway number two, which is the green line, means that we're gonna reconstruct it in 2020, thicken up our base. Okay, so we're gonna go to 508 millimeter thick base and then from there, just looking at overlays. The orange line, same approach, except for we're gonna thicken it up a little bit more. 
And then pathway number four, again, reconstructing in 2020. Okay. And then you can see fewer overlays are required with that thicker base moving into the future. Okay. Another pathway adding on, if we start with pathway one, okay, so that's where we're starting. This is pathway six, where in 2040, we decide to go ahead and do the reconstruction okay, and thicken the base to the 500 mill eight millimeters <clears throat> in the year 2040. Another option to consider would be wait to 2060 and thicken it up to the 610. Okay, so you can see these different pathways, you can look at all sorts of different combinations of when you're doing the reconstruction and when you do the overlay. Now, once you've got these different pathways, okay, you need to assess them. Okay, so you wanna compare the present value costs of all those different reasonable pathways. So again, you're going through a process of identifying what's a reasonable adaptation pathway and you're only gonna evaluate those. So we'll compare the present cost for each of the different scenarios that we're evaluating and then identify those options that are cost effective, but also robust and flexible. Okay, again, making sure that we're not doing something now that prevents something, a beneficial action sometime in the future based on the information that we have. And then you use a stepwise approach. Okay, so allow for reevaluation okay, with different refinements. Again, as climate models um, evolve and you've got a better idea of those climate predictions, okay, then you'd revisit your timing table. Okay, once you've generated that plan, pavement climate sensitivity catalog, you can use it for all kinds of different predictions. Because again, the advantage of that is you've looked at the response of your pavement structure okay, to your climate variables, and it's not tied with time. Okay? It's not tied to a certain scenario. It's not tied to a certain time frame. Okay? So you can always go back and with better information or refined information, you can adjust the timing of when those are gonna happen or when you expect things to happen. Okay, and again, don't take actions that preclude, preclude future actions. So for the different assessment of the pathways, you can do a pathways map. Okay, so once you've identified your most effective pathways, so for this particular example, pathway one, three, seven, 11, and 12, Okay, were identified after the cost analysis okay, as the most effective pathways. Okay, so now you can look at different ways of stepping from one pathway to the next, depending on what happens. Okay, so you can see pathway one, which is the gray line, it okay, just goes straight across and you can see for this pathway, for the asphalt overlay, which is designated by the X's, Okay, you're just doing overlays basically every 10 years. Okay? And then once you get to year 2070, the dashed line indicates that that particular payment design, depending on the scenario, may or may not be viable. So once we hit 2070 with that pathway one um, payment structure, some of the scenarios will show that the road's flooded. Once we get to 2080, all of the scenarios indicate that the roadway would be flooded. So you'd need to do something different. Okay, and then you can look at, again, those different pathways. So pathway three okay, would be reconstructing in 2020 okay, to a base thickness of 610 and then overlays from there forward. Okay, so in this way, you can look at those different pathways Okay, and you can look at transferring from one pathway to another and the potential impacts. You can also create a scorecard, which is shown down in the lower right, which gets you your present, very, um, present value costs okay, and under the different scenarios. Okay, so that just shows an example of the different pathways and um, the costs that were calculated for that scorecard. The other way you can represent this data again is looking at the different pathways. Okay, and this is just presenting that same information in a different format. 
okay, where you're looking at different scenarios. So there's the RCP, the lower scenario on the left, the higher scenario on the right. And this particular graph is just showing you the timing of those different overlays that need to be placed. And the numbers in the bars are the thickness of the overlay that gets you to exactly that 85% reliability. Okay, so again, in this way, you can look at um, you know, how much additional asphalt we're talking about just on the overlays and when the re reconstruction and the rehabilitation would take place for those different pathways. Okay, that's indicated by the stars. So it's, again, a, a different way of looking at the same data and comparing those different pathways and looking at um, you know, the implications of choosing the different pathways um, for the different timeframes. So just um, wrapping up here, um, some of the factors that we want to consider when we're creating or changing the adaptation plan is, you know, the current condition of the pavement. That's going to be important consideration. When does it make sense, um, you know, with everything else to do overlays or do uh, rehabilitation or reconstruction? Okay? And then the climate and traffic projections, have those changed? Okay? Do you need to go back and revisit the timing, revisit the traffic? Okay, and looking at it from that perspective. Okay. Um, are there new materials con to consider? Okay. Different types of um, you know, uh, asphalt um, additives or modified, okay, different types of base materials potentially. Um, in that case, you'd wanna go back and you'd wanna create your um, pavement climate sensitivity catalogs using those materials as well. Okay, and then, the condition of the service area. Okay, what are you looking at for the future? Okay, again, putting things into a, a, a bigger perspective or taking a wider view of it. Okay, and then again, this is not something that you plan and, and sit on the shelf. Okay, you're gonna wanna reevaluate that adaptation plan on a regular basis. So some of the recommendations for future work along this line, um, okay, you that those developing those pavement climate sensitivity catalogs okay, is really a critical step. Okay? We need to develop those for different climate stressors, traffic levels, different materials and pavement structures. Again, we just illustrated uh, a small one for this particular approach, okay? but these are really powerful tools um, that then you can use. Uh, making sure that that pavement model input for the future climate stressors um, needs to be simplified. <laughs> it is rather complex at the moment dealing with all the different pieces and parts. Um, so kind of a thought process on how better to be able to incorporate that future climate information okay, and different material properties into your pavement models. And then one thing that wasn't included um, as part of this analysis is really the carbon footprint of the different adaptation options. Okay, so pulling that in and considering all the different life cycle costs um, when you're choosing those different adaptation strategies. So just an overall summary, um, we know the climate's changing, okay, and we know that the changes are projected to accelerate. Okay. We know that um, continuing with current design practices will result in re reduced pavement performance and service life, so we really need to um, develop our methods for incorporating that future climate information. Okay, and we can, we've shown that we can incorporate those quantitative projections okay, and help us to prepare for risks that we know have the potential to identify, uh, to intensify um, as changes become greater. So with that, um, just wanted to acknowledge the folks that have worked on this research, again, Jane Knott, um, PhD student or recent graduate, um, Ann Stoner, uh, Dr. Jennifer Jacobs and Ishan Dawe at UNH, um, and also Catherine Hayhoe. And then acknowledging the support um, from New Hampshire Sea Grant, um, NHDES, National Science Foundation, as well as a bunch of our different collaborators on this work. And with that, thanks for your attention and happy to take questions that folks have. Thank you very much, well, Dr. Sias. Well, that was a very interesting presentation. Um, we have a question from Isaac in the chat. Isaac, you can go ahead, please. Uh, 
Yeah, yes. Thank you so much, Professor, for this very interesting presentation. I think the topic is, is really important because of the climate change that we're facing. I have a couple of questions. The first one is regarding the parameter that you're studying, which is mainly temperature. Uh, is it reasonable to just assume that the impact of climate change is will affect the temperature? Because the other things that I think about is maybe the radiation and how it affect uh, the, the, the material and how brittle it will become. So for example, if we're thinking about rotting, we know that whenever the temperature increases, uh, the, the rotting will increase, but maybe the material will become more brittle. Uh, so the, the effect might not be as clear as just incorporating the, the, the temperature. So what do you think about this is the first question. And the second question is about the water table. Uh, I, I totally get why a water table is very important to include, but do you think it's practical to include it for like a large area? Do, uh, like, do we have the data? Because this water table can change greatly from one location to the other, even within the same city. Um, so it, it, can we get such a big database of what is the water table around the world if somebody wants to design something near their home or, or something else? Sure, thanks. Thanks for your questions. Um, so addressing your first question in terms of temperature, again, the, we illustrated the, the framework developed um, for a combination of changes in temperature and groundwater level. Um, but really you can use you know, whatever you think are the important uh, parameters that you want to evaluate. Um, and then you're gonna develop your pavement climate sensitivity catalogs based on changes to those parameters. Um, so those aren't, you know, we acknowledge those aren't the only parameters that are important for payments, um, but those are just the two that we use to illustrate, illustrate the framework um, for this particular case study. So I agree, there's other things that you do need to consider. And, you know, in some areas, you know, some of those parameters or some of those um, different variables may be more or less important than others, um, which leads into the groundwater question. So. Um, if you go back to, and I didn't spend a lot of time um, going through it um, when I was presenting this, um, but going back to um, this particular case study, that figure on the, the right-hand side, um, that shows the expected changes to the groundwater as a function of sea level rise. Um, and that was, that's took a lot of work um, because it's basically a groundwater model um, that needed to be, there was an existing groundwater model for the seacoast, but it needed to be um, modified and calibrated to look at what's happening to the groundwater levels um, in relation to uh, the, the pavement structure. So there needed to be some refinement to the, the groundwater models there. Um, so usually there's a lot of information um, for groundwater levels for from different types of applications, lots of different monitoring wells or just, you know, all kinds of wells in certain areas. Um, but really the modeling side of it and the groundwater model side of it is something that needs to be done. Um, and there are ongoing efforts um, for developing groundwater models or refining um, groundwater models for various regions, at least of the U.S., um, with the intent of the entire coastline, coastal areas of, of, of the U.S. having established groundwater models. So even if they might not exist now, there's the, um, you know, approaches to be able to do that. And it's something that is in the process of being developed. Thank you, Dr. Sayas. Um, we have a question from Mohammed. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Um, great presentation indeed. Uh, I have also two questions. Uh, first one regarding the scenario-based approach, uh, which is basically based on the Ashover Paven ME design uh, program. So my question is really regarding the performance models that are uh, being used in the, in the program. So uh, for instance, up here in Ontario, Canada, we do have locally calibrated performance model for the province. But the issue is that these models are again calibrated based on historic climate data. And under this scenario based uh, approach, we are again using the same models to predict the performance by late century or uh, basically 2100. 
So my question is that, uh, in your opinion, is this going to introduce any error in the uh, performance prediction, given that all these models are again based on historic climate data? And the, uh, okay, uh, should I go ahead with the second one or? It's uh, up to you. Okay, uh, thanks. So I'll, I'll go with the second one as well, because I, I feel that it's somehow again related to the first one. It's re regarding the reliability uh, for the, again, performance models. So in your opinion, again, the RCP or the uncertainty in the uh, climate data, is it related again somehow to the reliability levels that we define at the beginning of the design practice, for example, for IRI or rotting? or are they uh, totally separate or they cannot be really combined in any way? So that's my two questions. Okay, so let me, I, I think I'm gonna, my answer is gonna kind of get to both of those. Um, so for, so you've got your climate models and then you've got your pavement models. And the way the framework's put together is that if there's improvements in either side, Okay, basically you can plug in and use the new models to do the analysis. So, um, you know, we acknowledge go, getting to your first question that in our pavement models, you know, it, they're not perfect. So we know we're constantly working on better ways to model, model our pavements. Um, in the pavement models right now, um, you're looking at the relationship between um, those environmental variables and how the pavement responds. So as long as they are calibrated in terms of how we know current pavement materials and pavement structures respond to the combination and traffic and environmental loading that they're exposed to now, changing those, unless there's something that goes beyond the bounds of where those models work, I wouldn't expect future climate um, to have an impact on how well those models work. Um, it'd be like, you know, taking that same pavement model and, you know, using it in the northern part of the U.S. or Canada, um, you're going to use that same pavement model and, and trust it to the same extent if you're using it in a warmer climate. Okay, so we know enough about the range of the performance of the pavement structures and materials under that you know, wide enough range that I think, you know, the future climate um, would be incorporated in the range that the pavement model is, is calibrated for from the perspective of the relationship between those climate stressors and the pavement performance. Um, in terms of, you know, the reliability and the uncertainty that comes from multiple sources. So there's uncertainty in the climate projections due to the models themselves. Okay, so just like our pavement models, we've got some uncertainty in the modeling um, itself. But then there's also uncertainty in terms of what the future is actually going to look like. So there's different sources of uncertainty. Um, and as you move into the future, the relative proportion of those different uncertainties in our climate projections change. So when you're looking shorter term, the uncertainty in those climate projections are mostly due to the uncertainty in the models themselves. Okay, when you look further into the future, the uncertainty becomes more dominated by, we don't know what human population is going to do. Um, so it changes. And so that's part of why it's important to not just consider um, different scenarios, but also consider the different models because the different models deal with that uncertainty differently. Okay, so when you looked at, um, let me go back to that slide. So this slide here, um, this figure that has the multiple colored lines representing the different models. It's really important to consider those different models because we don't know which one does a better job at projecting the future. Um, we don't know. And so you want to have that range of information and you want to propagate that uncertainty through our pavement models. Okay? And again, that's, it's an important thing to consider is, is the propagation of that uncertainty through the model. So you've got uncertainty 
in the climate data that's going into the model, you've got the uncertainty of the pavement model itself, and you've got to kind of sort through how that translates to you know, uncertainty in your final projections. But it's important to consider and it's important to realize that there's differences okay, under those different scenarios and that range of you know, probably, the probable futures. That answered my question. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Sayas and Mohammed. We have a question from like Amin, who just who raised hand. Uh, you are muted. Okay. Thank you for your presentation, Joe. Uh, my name is Amin Komili from University of Guelph. Uh, I want to know your comments about. Uh, like uh, taking average, uh, te average temperature or maximum daily temperature for payment analysis. You know, uh, my opinion is that for like this assumption uh, would be like reasonable assumption for regions with, uh, that uh, we have like a, a kind of like less fluctuation in temperature throughout the year. But in some locations such as in Canada, we have a significant fluctuation uh, of temperature during the year or maybe from month to month. So assuming uh, average temperature for payment analysis, I think uh, would introduce uh, like a source of uh, uncertainty in, in the result. I just want to know if you have any idea how to improve that assumption. Yes, no, so I agree. I think, um, you know, again, depends on, um, you know, what issues you're really focused on. So again, in, in some, environments it's that freeze thaw it's that cycling temperature cycling that's most damaging and in that case that's something that's more important to look at and to consider um, and that's one thing that I, I didn't mention when I was was going through the talking is um, you know the other thing that's changing is it's not just the temperature but the number of freeze thaw cycles again in some areas is drastically increasing so things that were, you know, used to freeze and stay frozen are now going through multiple freeze thaw cycles, which, you know, can substantially change the performance of, of the payment structure. Um, or, you know, just simple thermal cycling and, and those changes that you're seeing. Um, so in those instances, again, you're going to want to look at different types of performance parameters and pot potentially different types of payment models to get at what you think or what you know you need to look at um, in terms of, of the performance of your system. So it's not, it's not a one size fits all. Okay. You really have to go through that process of determining what's important okay, and what those environmental parameters are. And again, you know, when I talked about you know, selecting those um, model parameters and the performance, okay, that's an important part of it because you want to make sure you're evaluating what you think is going to be important. When you're doing this analysis. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have time for another short question. And I actually have a real question, well, Dr. Sias. Um, well, did you have a chance to look at the results uh, with a sensitivity like analysis by changing your threshold for failure or your um, of reliability level, for example, or to see how that would actually change. Like if we were to wait another half and uh, like a quarter inch of rutting, maybe we can, we'll tolerate to see what happens. Yeah, that's, it's not something that we did in the case study, but that's absolutely something that you could do um, in, in your analysis. Um, and again, depending on the goals of what you're trying to do, um, and you know the particular site or systems that you're evaluating, you're going to want to set what those threshold values are, and and potentially you know modify what those could be. But it wasn't something that we ran through in this particular one. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I think we are like out of time. So well, thanks a lot, well, Dr. Sias. It was a, a privilege to have you here. Um, Thanks for the opportunity. I enjoyed it. Thank you. And I will see you all next week for the next CAN seminar. Thank you.